Good morning, church. My name is Hugh, and I'm one of the pastors here. I invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to be in chapters 2, 3, and 4 this morning. When my kids were very young, I got into the habit of telling them stories at night when I would tuck them into bed. And as I began the story, I would have a definite end of the story in my mind. And then along the way, I would just make up all kinds of stuff in the middle of the story. I would insert crazy stuff, these twists and turns. Now, it didn't bother me at all. It really troubled my kids. They got confused. They got concerned. How's the princess going to be saved, Daddy? What's going to happen? Is the good guy going to win? It didn't bother me a bit because I knew how the story was going to end. This morning, we're going to hear about a story that's got lots of twists and turns. And yet, it is a story with a definitive ending because God is the author of the story. Let's pray and we will begin. Father, thank you for giving us your word, for revealing yourself to us. This morning, give us eyes to see and understand. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, we saw how David responded to the news that Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle. And he mourned them. He grieved. This morning, our text begins with the vague description, some time later. We read in chapter 2, verse 1. Some time later, David inquired of the Lord, should I go to one of the towns of Judah? The Lord answered him, go. Then David asked, where should I go? To Hebron, the Lord replied. So David loads up his household. He gets his private army and their families and they go to Hebron. And then we get the announcement that Judah has made David king. Verse 4, then the men of Judah came and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. Now talk about anticlimactic. David's coronation doesn't even get the full focus of this single verse. Now what's going on here? Perhaps the narrator doesn't make a big deal about this because it's only a small part of what was originally planned. God's intention was for all of Israel and Judah to recognize his kingship. But here, it's just Judah in the south that's recognizing David's kingship. And we're going to see in the following pages that when Saul died, his death created political unrest in the land. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of rivalry going on. I've got a graphic here that I'm going to try to update as we go along. We've got Judah in the south, Israel in the north, and the text is going to refer to Judah as the house of David, to Israel as the house of Saul. Those are, those are synonyms. And so we see here that David is installed as king in Judah. We pick up in verses 8 through 11. Abner son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Saul's son Ishbosheth and moved him to Mahinam. He made him king over Gilead, Asher, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, over all Israel. Saul's son Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he became king over Israel. He reigned for two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, if you recall, Abner was King Saul's right-hand man. So he's still around, and Abner takes Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and makes him king over Israel. One has to wonder... If a general, if the right-hand man of the king has the authority to crown someone as king, where does the power really lie? We'll get clarity as the text goes on. So Judah... 
as a people, they, they give David the crown. Abner, as a single individual, makes Ishbosheth the king in the north. We read on in verses 12 and following how we see the beginning of a civil war that's going to break out between the north and the south. Verse 12 says, Abner, son of Ner, and soldiers of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, marched out from Mahinam to Gibeon. So Joab and Zariah, Joab, son of Zariah, and David's soldiers marched out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. The two groups took up positions on opposite sides of the pool. All right, so we're introduced to another character here. Joab is David's general, his right-hand man. Now, archaeologists have discovered this pool of Gibeon. It was a, a, a rock cistern that was cut out of the mountains to hold water. It's about 35 feet by 35 feet. So they, the two armies line up on opposite sides of the pool. Somebody makes the suggestion, hey, there's no sense in it's all fighting. So you get your best 12. I'll get my best 12 and let's line them up. And the text says that they lined up. And they all killed one another immediately. So the best 12 on both sides are killed. Chaos breaks out and fighting ensues. And the summary is in verse 17. The battle that day was extremely fierce. And Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by David's soldiers. So Abner see was, sees what's going on. He takes flight. He starts running for his life. Our text is going to introduce that Joab has two brothers, Abishai, and I'm forgetting then how we spell this other one, Asahel. So the text says that Asahel is like a gazelle. He's so fast. So he sees Abner running off. Asahel is chasing after him. And the text gives this really funny interaction. Asahel is chasing Abner and they're having a conversation. Abner's like, hey, cut it out. Quit chasing me. He's like, no, I'm after you. I'm going to catch you. Abner sees that he can't get away. He stops and slams the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach and it kills him on the spot. The rest of the guys, they give chase. Finally, they call a ceasefire. And the chapter ends with the description that 20 men in the south of Judah have died, but nearly 20 times that in Israel have been killed in the battle. Chapter 3 opens up saying that the house of Judah is gaining in power. But the house of Israel is waning in power. And then specifically inside the house of Israel, Abner is on the way up. He's increasing in his power and his authority. And then things go badly inside of Israel. Division occurs. Ishbosheth accuses Abner of sleeping with one of his father's concubines. We don't know if he did or if he didn't. We don't know if it was a move that Abner was making to take something that belonged to the king in one step towards taking the throne. We don't know what happened, but we do know how he responds. We read in verse 8b through 11. All, this is Abner speaking. All this time I've been loyal to the family of your father Saul, to his brothers and to his friends, and haven't betrayed you to David. But now you accuse me of wrongdoing with this woman? May God punish Abner and do so severely if I don't do for David what the Lord swore to him, to transfer the kingdom from his house, from the house of Saul, and establish the throne of David over Israel and Judah, from Dan to Beersheba, Ishbosheth did not dare respond to Abner because he was afraid of him. So Abner. He says, I've been loyal. I haven't betrayed you in any way. And now you're going to make this accusation. And what does he do immediately? He betrays Ishbosheth. He defects over to David's side. So he reaches out to David. He tries to strike a covenant between um, Israel and David. He goes to the elders of Israel and says, hey, surely you see what David's done. Surely you're ready to go over to his side. He has them ready. 
Abner goes to meet, uh, goes to Hebron to meet with David to nail down all the terms of this agreement. He says, Israel's ready to flip to your side. And then in verses 21 through 23, three consecutive verses, the text says that David sent Abner away in peace. He sends him away in peace. They come to an agreement and sends him away under safe passage from Hebron. But just like a good soap opera, the timing is such that as Abner is leaving, Joab is returning. So he's upset that, that Abner has killed his brother Asahel. He challenges David, what have you done? You let our enemy get away? David, don't you see that there's really only one hurdle preventing you from taking the throne? It is Abner, and you let this guy go away? So Joab pursues Abner, and, he, and he's deceitful. He says, hey, let's come over here and talk for a second. I'd like a word with you in private. And what he does is he takes a sword and kills Abner. Verse 28 says that uh, David learned about this action. David declares himself to be innocent of the matter. He's got nothing to do with it. He curses Joab and Abishai. He doesn't kill the men, but hum he humiliates them. He makes them lead in the funeral procession to put on sackcloth, to mourn. So they're not killed, but they're kind of just pushed off to the side for the time being. The way that chapter ends, the people of Israel see how David has mourned Abner's death. Verse 36, all the people took note of this and it pleased them. In fact, everything the king did pleased them. On that day, all the troops and all Israel were convinced that the king had no part in, in the killing of Abner, son of Ner. Chapter 4 opens with Ishbosheth hearing of Abner's death and he's dismayed. He gives up. He's weak hearted. And we learn that Ishbosheth has two soldiers working for him. Their names are Bana and Rechab. They, they go out and lead in raiding. And then in verse 4, we have this strange list, uh, uh, description of this young man, Mephibosheth. This is Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son. We learn in the text that at a very young age that his nurse was holding him. They were fleeing the news after Saul and Jonathan were killed. She had a fall and the child was injured. He doesn't come up again until chapters 8 or 9 and he's going to be a very important figure there. So the narrator returns back to Bana and Rechab and says that, that they've been devious, that they, they go to Ishbosheth's house in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, and under the guise of going in to find something to eat, they go in and they murder Ishbosheth. They remove his head and they want to take it to David. They obviously never read 2 Samuel chapter 1. Otherwise, they would know that David would not be impressed with something like this. He says, as the Lord lives, the one who has redeemed my life from every distress. When the person told me, look, Saul is dead, he thought he was a bearer of good news. But I seized him and put him to death at Ziklag. That was my reward to him for his news. How much more... When wicked men kill a righteous man in his own house, on his own bed, so now should I not require his blood from you and purge you from the earth? And the text says that's what he did. That he eliminates both of these men for their wickedness. So we can look back at, the, at what's going on in the house of David, in the house of Israel. The only one left in in Saul's entire house is a child that's lame in both feet. He is not a rival to David's throne. David alone is left on his side. So what lessons can we learn from these chapters, from these twists and turns? 
First lesson, God's plans cannot be stopped. God's plans cannot be stopped. Saul had hunted David for years in hopes of retaining his throne. Treacherous people killing others in, advance, in hopes of advancing an agenda. David, don't you see how easy it would be to secure your throne if you just killed Saul? If you just did that, if, if you just took these easy steps, you could have it made. We need to see that men cannot achieve God's plans on their own. The scriptures are going to repeatedly use this expression, human hands. In Psalm 135, it's human hands are used to describe how people worship before idols that have been made with human hands. Mark 14, Jesus said he'd destroy the temple made with human hands and he would rebuild a new one in three days. We read in Acts chapter 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. The, the point of these kind of passages is that the truth would be hammered down into our hearts that God is not relying on our hands. God is not dependent upon us for his life and being. He is self-existent. He lacks nothing. He does not need our hands to accomplish his purposes. And yet, after all of this mess, David is now on the cusp of being anointed king over all of Israel and Judah. Who but a sovereign God could take all that mess and produce something good, to produce something positive, to achieve his desired ends. God will accomplish his ends despite our hindrance or our help. The reality of God's sovereignty means that God is able to take evil intentions of men and do something good, to produce something redemptive. Peter, in preaching Christ in his Pentecost sermon, Acts 2.23, speaking of Jesus, he says, Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God uses the lawless actions of men to accomplish his foreordained plans. God used the greatest injustice in the history of the world, the sinless Savior dying in the place of sinners to accomplish our salvation. So we should ask, what is too difficult for God if he can take the worst of the worst to accomplish the best of the best? Now our temptation to, is to take this and package it into a doctrinal soundbite. I'm just going to store that away. I'm going to be ready to answer a question in core class. I'll be ready to contribute something in small group. I might even be prepared to answer a quiz question in Bible school. God's sovereignty is not primarily a theological concept to master. It's not this abstract idea. It's a concrete reality that should touch our hearts. That there is an almighty one on the throne. And this almighty one is for you. If you're in Christ, he is for you. He's committed to you. He's never going to leave you. He's dead set to fulfill all that he's promised to you. Sovereignty is one of the reasons that we can trust that he's able to fulfill what he's promised. Sovereignty means not only that we can trust him, but we must trust him. And that's our second lesson to learn. God's plans cannot be stopped and we must trust him because life never happens in a straight line. I'll explain that last phrase in a moment. The author in 2 Samuel is presenting David in these chapters as someone that's actively trusting God. The way has, has been cleared. Saul's out of the picture. 
There's nothing stopping David from leaving the land of the Philistines, returning to Judah, to actively pursuing the throne himself. It's time to go, David. Go take what's rightfully yours. There's nothing blocking you anymore. But what we see in these opening verses is that David's inquiring of the Lord. Lord, is now the time? Do I go now? Where do I go? He doesn't want to get ahead of the Lord. He's trusting God all the way. We can think about Abraham. He did the same thing. He didn't think about God's sovereign call as an idea, but he connected that call to the person that made the promise. We read in Romans chapter 4, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, the one who gives, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. That's some power. He, Abraham, believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body to be already dead since he was about a hundred years old and also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to do. He believed that God was able to do it. God always gets his way in the end. He always accomplishes his means. But it's very, very rare that it happens immediately. God never works where life is a straight line for us. We have to travel curvy roads. Last fall, I got to go on a big adventure. I went out west with some buddies. We started out northern Colorado on the Wyoming border and we rode motorcycles south through the mountains and we camped every night and it was epic. One morning we were coming down out of elevation, going down through a valley and at the bottom we get to the Colorado River. As we're trying to cross over the, uh, the bridge to get to the other side and continue on, we encounter a train. There's the river and there's a set of train tracks running parallel to it. And so we, the train goes by, we cross, and this is one of my favorite memories of the trip. We start racing the train because it's the river, the train tracks, and then the dirt road that we were on. It's, they're all running parallel together. It was amazing. Now, do you think the river runs dead straight through the mountains? No, the river is winding through finding the lowest spot through the valley, getting around this mountain and cutting back left to get around this mountain. And so also the train tracks go. Now, even a rookie engineer that's never driven a train, that's never been on this route, the final destination is determined for this guy because he's on steel rails. He's going to get where he's wanting to go. Even if he doesn't know what's around the next curve. Even if he can't imagine what's ahead. He's going to reach his destination if he keeps going forward. Consider the curvy path that David had to walk. It was back in 1 Samuel 16 that that Samuel anointed David to be king. We don't know exactly how much time has gone by, but it's been at least a decade. And we, we can know that from two points of reference. Next week when Walker preaches chapter 5, we're going to see that David is 30 years old when he's anointed king over all Israel. If you go back to 1 Samuel 17, when all of David's brothers are fighting with the army of Israel and they're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath, well, the reason that David wasn't there is that he wasn't old enough. So he had to have been younger than 20 years old because he wasn't eligible to serve in the army. So at least a decade, David's been waiting to get to this point and all he's encountered along the way are curvy roads. Samuel anoints him to be king, 
but he ends up serving in Saul's court. He's playing music when Saul's in one of his fits. He's serving as one of Saul's captains in battle, and he does that until he, he's too successful, and Saul gets jealous. And then he's running for his life from Saul's attacks. He moves to, land, to the land of the Philistines, and, and yet we can see now that there have been steel rails in David's life getting him to a determined set outcome. It was a certainty that he would be anointed king because God declared it, but it certainly was not a straight line for David. Think about the history of redemption in the Bible. Sin entered the world for the first time in the garden. God declares following that sin. He says to the woman, there's going to be a seed that comes from you. And that seed is going to crush the serpent's head. Redemption had certainly been eternally in the mind of God. But this is the first time that we get a glimpse of the gospel in the pages of scripture. Do we really think that God is wringing his hands when he made the statement? Man, I hope I can fulfill this promise. I hope that I can make this good. Once again, this is another way in which we can have great confidence in our confession that God is sovereign, that his plans come to pass. He will certainly succeed in bringing salvation to his people, but it has not been a straight line. The curves in the road last a few thousand years. Old Abraham and his wife Sarah, y'all are going to have so many kids you can't even count them. Well, that's a laugh. Joseph, sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, falsely accused, thrown in prison, and just forgotten for 14 years. Moses, I'm going to call you to free my people, but first you need to go be a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years. And when I do get you out, I'm going to do all the heavy lifting, and I'm going to give you a land, but it's going to take you all a while. It's going to take you a long while to find that land. Israel's given the law, prophets, temple, priests, sacrificial system. All these things are placeholders for when the Messiah would finally come. All those years, all those turns in the road to get to Jesus. And then he comes. And you're like, okay, it's starting to finally get good. I can see some straightness in the road ahead. He's ministering. He's healing. Palm Sunday, the crowds yell, Hosanna, salvation. Blessed is the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then a week later, that same crowd is shouting, crucify. They kill the king of glory. They, they whip him, curse him. They spit on him. They, they mock him by placing a crown of thorns on his head. Is there any doubt that Jesus will be crowned king of kings? But how could it happen like this? Redemption does not come in a straight line. Think about the history and mission of the church. Jesus declares, I will build my church and not even the gates of hell could stand against it. We read in Acts chapter 1 that the Spirit's going to come. It's going to empower Jesus' followers. So they're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and, and the ends of the earth. And then through the book of Acts, what we see is that the means by which the gospel goes forward is persecution. Opposition is trying to stamp out this movement. And as the followers go, they take the message with them. The church does grow. The gospel does spread, but it comes by the curvy road of persecution. Missionaries like William Carey in India, Adoniram Judson in Burma, they sold everything. They left their homes. They packed their belongings in coffins to go to people that had no hope in Christ. And they labored among those people's for six or seven years before they saw their first convert. Do you think that they showed up with grand ideas that they're going to preach Christ and people are going to flock? Well, they might not have had that kind of naivete, but they probably did not expect to labor for years before they saw the first convert. 
We think about how the gospel is advancing in our day. Even the most optimistic among us are going to be tempted to think, we're not gaining ground, we're losing ground here. How's the gospel advancing? How, how can Jesus' promises be true? How can the church expand and the gospel take root in hearts and flourish everywhere if it feels like we're getting pressed in on every side? We have to remember that God's plans cannot be stopped. And here's a very, very important thing to remember. That present circumstances do not determine final ends. Present circumstances do not determine final ends. Think about the doctrine of glorification, for example. This is a biblical doctrine that teaches that those that are in Christ, one day God will use the same power that he exercised in raising Jesus from the dead to give us new bodies, to conform our lowly bodies to be matched with Jesus' glorious body. With every passing day, it is objectively true that I am one day closer to having a glorified body. But it's also true that with every day that passes, my body is farther and farther away from a glorified state. Last week, I bought my first pair of reading glasses. So that's awesome. My hair's falling out. I got a couple months ago, I was at Great Clips, which might have been a mistake. I'm, I'm seated there and I tell the young lady what I would like. She immediately turns to her supervisor and says, do I cut the top or the back first? I'm like, oh man, I've only got so many haircuts left in me. I can't go out like this. <laughs> Last week we had the summer league interns to our house. We ate dinner and then they just play soccer in the front yard for a couple of hours. I'm like, well, I remember what that's like. That, that looks neat. I'd like to try that again sometime. It would be easy for me to make conclusions. My body is on a definite trajectory and it's not towards glorification. It would be easy to say these present circumstances, well, they just must mean that glorification is not ever going to happen. Our bodies are on a trajectory away from it, but pre present circumstances do not determine final ends. What about your personal experience? There's probably very few in the room this morning that would say, it's been a very straight line for me. Everything that has happened is exactly what I thought was going to happen. In fact, it's exactly the way that I would have drawn it up for myself. Friends, we must trust in a sovereign God because life doesn't happen in a straight line. We have to travel the curvy path. None of us know what's around the next bend. And so we trust him. We must trust him. Let's consider some contemporary implications. How many people have deconstructed their faith because the circumstances of their lives haven't gone the way they thought it would? The error they make is allowing present circumstances to determine final ends. Why is my life so hard? Jesus, I believe what you said. I trusted you. I believe that you died for my sins. I, I believed all the stuff that I was taught, but my life has not gone the way I wanted it to go. You owe me. Where have you been? I thought it would be different. I thought, I don't know what I thought. I thought it would just be different than this. So now I'm rethinking everything. If someone told you that following Christ would be easy, or that it would cost you nothing, then they have not understood the Christian faith. Faith and belief are vitally important, but so is following Jesus. And that means following Jesus along the curves in the road. There has to be more 
to faith than just believing, but there has to be an active, living reliance upon Jesus and a determination, I'm going to follow this king. That's what David did. Rather than letting the circumstances sink our faith, how does both knowing and expecting that curves in the road are going to come, how does that help you stay on the road? How does that help you navigate through them? Even more than just navigating through them, it should cause you to press in to the king and the author of life. Press in knowing that this author is trustworthy. We don't know what's around the next curve, but we know who's going to be there with us. What about your own perceptions of how you're growing in holiness? It's, it's been my experience that it's entirely normative to go through seasons. There are seasons where you're pursuing the Lord and seasons where you're hot, your heart is hot for Jesus and you can see visible growth. You are growing in godliness and people around you see it. And then there are other seasons of life where you're pursuing the Lord and your heart is hot for Jesus and you just don't see any results. You don't see any growth. In fact, it may feel like you're regressing. Here again, saints, it's important for us to remember that present circumstances of a hard season do not determine what is ahead. They do not determine final ends. We know that because God is sovereign, he who has started a good work in you is going to finish it. The one who called you is able to keep you. The Father sent Jesus to redeem us. He held nothing back. He gave his spirit to take up residence, to abide in us. Do you think he's going to give up after so much investment, after giving us his very best? So don't stop fighting for holiness. Don't stop trusting the Lord, even in those seasons that are really hard. Let the rough patch be the motivation to press closer to him. I think it's important for us to recognize that there's a lot of mess in these chapters this morning. In the, in the uh, depiction of Judah and David growing in power, the next verse is say, that six sons are born to David. Just to, to show how much his house is growing. But it's six sons by six different wives. There's all this murder. There's all this stuff that's just unsavory. There's messed up stuff in these passages. I think it's crucial for us to see that God is here also. God is not running away and hiding from the mess. He's not grossed out, weirded out, or freaked out by the dirt in our lives. I've got a great friend that commonly notes how silly it is for many contemporary Christians that think that God is incapable of being in the presence of sin. First of all, God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Second, being in the mere presence of sin does not invalidate his holiness. Our sin doesn't make God dirty. It's his holiness that removes our filth. God doesn't get driven away by sin. Rather, King Jesus is one that comes into it. He steps close. He stoops down to meet us in our need. To work his grace and accomplish redemption in us in less than perfect circumstances. The curvy road can cause us to forget, so we need to remind one another. That's one of the purposes of why we sing together. The whole people of God, the, this family of faith, declaring in song what we believe. But we have to recognize that there are some in the room this morning that it's hard for them to sing that Jesus is better. Because life circumstances are painful. They're difficult. And yet we read in Colossians 
3, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And then it's amazing. How do we accomplish this teaching and admonishing? Through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We're singing to the Lord, but we're admonishing one another. How does your congregational singing change if you view it as a ministry? That in your season of strength, in your season of stability, it's easy for me right now to sing Jesus is better. But maybe the person next to you, it's not easy for them. Maybe it's hard for them. Don't sing as a performance. I don't know the difference between a pitch and a key, and I know some of you don't either. But sing out. Because there are people around you, brothers and sisters, that it's hard for them to sing. It's so easy for us to forget that God's plans come to pass, that he's with us in the curvy road, and so we need reminders. That's why Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He was at the table with his closest disciples. He wanted to communicate something through normal, natural items, something that would communicate supernatural truth. He took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body. And he took a cup, saying this is the cup of the new covenant. It was promised long ago in the prophets, but now the time has come where God will be your God and dwell among you to take up residence in your hearts. I want to invite the band to come on up. This morning we come to the table to remind us it's a reminder for us that God's plans do come to pass. That we can trust him because Jesus has walked the curvy path for us. Coming to the table is a profession that Jesus is ours by faith and we rely on him. This table is a proclamation that Jesus is our shepherd and he'll never leave us. Who's the table for? The table's for Christians. The table is for those that have placed their faith in Jesus. The table is for those that are committed to following Jesus, to doing what he says. And so Paul warns us, don't come to the table in an unworthy manner. Don't come without giving thought to your life, to your heart. Don't proclaim something in taking the supper that's not true of your heart. So this table is for Christians. So non-Christians, we ask you to pass on the table and trust Jesus instead. I'm going to pray and the servers are going to come forward. As you're waiting on the elements, I encourage you to consider your heart and soul. Are there any sins that you need to repent of? Are there any relationships in the room that are not right? Take care of that before you take the supper. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift that we have in the gospel. Jesus, we thank you that you have given your everything to us. You've given yourself. And so this morning, as, as we take the bread and the cup, we remember what you have done for us, Jesus, that you... You're the lamb who's taken away our sins. You've taken it far from us. Lord, help us by your grace to remember that your plans come to pass, that we can trust you along the curvy path. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.